guys, welcome to Chef Grace's Place. So today we have a great guest. I've been meaning to get someone on the podcast that knows about wine. So today we have Rico Cooper. Yay. <laughs> How you doing, Chef? Good. Um, good. Good to be here. It's good to finally meet you and be able to talk with you. And thank you for choosing me to be on your show. I'm, I'm really appreciative. So you... I mean, well, what are you drinking? Let's go. Let's do that first. Huh? <laughs> I'm drinking something local. So um, a lot of people know during the summer, I, I'm an assistant to the winemaker at Misfits Winery over in Beltsville, Maryland, right outside of the D.C. area. So this is our blackberry dragon fruit. So just something small, light. It's Tuesday. Nothing too complicated today. I have some big tastings doing over the weekend. So I'm going to save my palate for that. But it's just some blackberry fruit. Um, you know, just a nice relaxing, um, wine, like I said, not too complicated. doesn't need too long to open up just something easy drinking, you can take on a picnic or just have with, you, you know, with a few friends. So that's pretty much it. So the, um, for the people who aren't watching this, your glass looks like it's got condensation on the outside and it is a red wine. So is that, is that chilled? Hello? Yeah, it's um, so yes. Yeah, so with the sweeter red wines, you can chill those. Um, if it's a dry red wine, you want it room temperature. Unless it's a little warm in your room, then you want it to, you know, you want to put it in the refrigerator, maybe five minutes. But this like I um, so this being a sweeter red wine, you can chill it. You don't want to well chill it and you destroy the nuances and everything, but you put a little slight chill on it. That was a great observation. You know, so the pastry chefs are very uh, detail oriented. <laughs> <laughs> so, and I'm going to be trying a jam jar, which you is featured on your Instagram. Thank you. Um, and really quick, um, you were talking about, I don't know where I saw you talking about it, but, um, you know, most people will grab a bottle that looks pretty. Mm -hmm. um i mean i really do like this bottle i love the pattern on it but <laughs> why uh what made you pick this wine in particular i always like i tell my clients i like the diamond in the rough and i like something that you would most likely turn away from and something at the store um the store owner just store managers and the wine experts would kind of turn away from and so on that particular um video i did I was pairing some spicy Indian food. And we're always taught in the wine world, when you have a spicy food, you want a sweet wine to balance it out. And so just trying around, I know usually people would use a Riesling, eating something Indian food with curry, but however, I just needed, you know, something aesthetically to go with it, something a little more color. So that's why I went with the jam jar. And as well as um, just to show people that, uh, I think people have walked past it, they didn't know, they didn't even know that um, that that the region that makes um, jam jar is South Africa. And so a lot of people didn't even know South Africa makes wine. So again, I'm always just trying to bring the diamond in the rough and just to educate all the time. So um, cheers, mm -hmm. everyone. There we go. Mm -hmm. So there we go. So we're gonna, there you go. <laughs> Look, smell, taste. That's really good. Mm -hmm. And again, um, with that particular wine, you notice it came in a screw cap and a lot of people will turn their nose to screw caps thinking that they're cheap but the benefit of having a screw cap wine is it's ready to go you don't have to sit out sit it out and let it sit for 20 minutes you don't have to decant it that is true so, yeah so i tell a lot of people if you're gonna have a party start early with some screw cap wines not every screw cap wine you know um <laughs> certain ones you want to stay away from you can dm me on that but Something like a jam jar, that's fine. Um, again, there are a few other ones from South Africa who do a fantastic job. They just happen to be screw cap. Um, just, you know, wines that you want to drink early. So you would start with those and then through the middle of the night, through the end of the, you know, course of the party or whatever. Then you'd have your your, your more drier reds that can be, that need time to, to, um, to breathe. Right. So mm -hmm. before we get like, down the rabbit hole on the wine because wine is such a i mean i uh i had to take wine when i was in um pastry school because i had 
a bachelor's degree. So I, I mean, I'm sure you know more than me, but <laughs> you I, know, hope so. um, <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> but uh, cancel this episode. <laughs> yeah, but uh, before we go down that rabbit hole, um, I'd like to ask you a couple questions about yourself. And, okay. And um, I really do want to get into some of the the basic wine stuff because uh, I was actually earlier today. Um, I interviewed Tom from the Pizzeria and Enzo show, uh, who you were a guest on. And uh, so he says hi. But anyway, <laughs> um, and I was telling him that, uh, you know, I was talking to, I was actually talking to my mom, throwing her under the bus again a couple weeks ago. And it was just, um, I realized that she didn't, she didn't realize that like, when you squeeze a grape, like the juice is clear for like all the grapes. <laughs> so, and then like, you know, the skin is what makes it red or white and stuff like mm-hmm. that. So I definitely do want to go into more of the, um, you know, how my wine is made and terroir and all that other stuff. But um, first let's talk about you. <laughs> That's um, one of my favorite subjects. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, so. <laughs> so yeah, so I've been, um, let's say working with wine since 2017. Okay. And um, what happened was I just got married. And as a I single did. guy, your bills are, you know, way different. So I would um, still work my daytime job and I ended up leaving it and just trying to pursue other things, try to job in marketing that didn't go well. And all of a sudden, a buddy of mine asked me to do some brand ambassador work. And I ended up liking it. It was a few tech shows. I'm from the D.C. area, and so here there's always something going on. You know, you live in this big city, something's always going on. Right. So we're doing those, and then um, somehow or other, I end up doing some power drinks and teas and food and cheese and just different other things. And so one guy calls me out of nowhere. It's Miami number. His name's Paul Carey, and he calls me, says, can you do some wines for me? I don't live in the D.C. area, but I'll pay you. And we do the wines, and everything goes well, but I didn't know anything about wine. And so I had to use that sales charm. So when people ask me questions, Ooh, I taste, I taste still. Is it made from still? Oh yeah. It's still. Oh, I taste apricot. Yeah, that is apricot. And then, I, um, but, um, I had a mentor early on who kind of coached me in and gave me, um, um, gave me some textbooks, which are nice and thick and, um, you know, just had to learn it. And then, um, because I ended up taking on more, um, wine shows, more wine events and, you know, just steadily weren't learning and learning. And then um, some events I would take the train and take the bus to just so I could study, sit there and study and have that extra time. And um, that's pretty much it. And just try to, you know, stay consistent with it. Um, Like I said, I had some really good mentors along the way. And um, that's pretty much it. I love it. When you started getting into it, um, Mm -hmm. one of the, I was, when I was in school, I was like super nerd. So I made friends with uh, one of the restaurant uh, management students and um, kind of weaseled my way into, well, I also, you know, just to level up my super nerdness, I also worked in the library <laughs> so <laughs> of the cooking school. So it was down the hall from the guy who ran the restaurant management program. So between my friend and me, I kind of weaseled my way onto the wine trip for the restaurant management kids. <laughs> um, but it was run by the Wine Educator Society or Wine Society of Educators, something like that. But that's based right out in Washington, D.C. So I was wondering if you uh, had done any um, educational stuff with them. So it's, it's funny. I did mine. Um, well, I did a couple different um if you're able to check, I did a couple of different programs, the wines of South Africa, but my main studies were um, WSET, Wine and Spirit Education Trust, and that's run through London. Okay. However, my yeah. class is through Napa in California, Napa mm-hmm. Online. So you can imagine me studying and trying to meet deadlines and like try to figure mm-hmm. out, you know, what, oh, okay, so if it's one o'clock here, what time's it in London? You know, but whatever, it was worth it though. I respect the business. It was, it was worth it. Yeah, one of the uh, the things people don't realize, like when I got to take wine in school, I was 
I it took I brought the book out just so I could show you. I was so like, you know, you see wine come up on your school schedule and you're like, this is the best college ever, you know, like I'm just gonna go and get drunk, right? No, mm -hmm. that's not what it is. Right. So, Especially uh, when you have to learn hectare and you have to learn like the European metric yeah. system. This fucking book yeah. is like one of the main There you go. books. And it was uh look how thick that thing is. Oh yeah, not, you know, I've got a couple of those. It's not a uh, small print right there. <laughs> so, uh, you know, it's so, and I really, you know, I was looking at your, uh, your certifications and stuff. Um, and one of the things that I think is cool is because you're not, you know, obviously you're not one of the, um, those people that make up most of the wine industry where they're either born, they're kind of like born into it, I would say, you know, right. they're, uh, you know, a lot of them are like from, from like France or Italy or places with huge wine cultures. Right. And then in America, it seems to be rich white people, you know, so, <laughs> um, that get to go into this field kind of and make it their profession, um, which is, you know, it, Good bottles of wine cost a lot of money, so yeah. it kind of makes sense. Um, so the other thing you see kind of coming from that is like when I would go to these wine conferences and stuff, people were like hyper specialized, you know, like the guy who knew about French wine didn't really know anything about Portuguese wine, mm. you know. So to see that you you have a Portugal uh, certification. You have the South African one, uh, Italian one. I don't know. I can't remember what else I saw in there. <laughs> it <didn't blush. laughs> it was like, but yeah. But so it's very, you know, if you're going, if you want to choose, like, you know, you're doing wine consulting and stuff like that. And it's, I think it's way better to have more of a, someone who's doing a little bit of everything than someone who's just, you know, hyper-focused in one region. But that's not to say those those people aren't good because, you know, that's a huge resource for you as someone who's, uh, you know, doing more of a general everywhere around the world thing. So it's pretty cool, I think, you know. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, again, it goes back to my mentor. Um, and she would always say, always be a student. And as soon as I would pass whatever certification, oh, that's good, Rico. OK, go back to studying, you know. Yeah. You never know. You never. You never a master. You never a master. You, you got to keep learning, and so just that that kind of old school mentality is what I kind of adopted. So, how um, like have you done? Because the people don't realize like from even from when I was in school. Because I mean, I had the internet when I was in school. Um, but like for these wine courses, like now they can give you an online course. They can ship all the wines to you and you can really learn wine from like, you know, your computer, <laughs> you know, um, and even having the, uh, are you, well, now I have another question in my head. Are you, um, <laughs> sorry, are you thinking about going to do uh, the, like, what do they call it? The wine expert certification or whatever it's called. So I have my, um, my base my WSCT one. Okay. So currently, um, just finished class on my W set level two. So I'll be taking that test the 14th of August. Can you explain really quick? Um, yeah. More in detail what those things are and what they entail. Cause people listening aren't going to know. Yes, ma'am. So basically when I'm taking the wine and spirit education trust, that's again, based in Europe, based in London, more specifically, and those courses, um, they have a general course for beginners. They have an intermediate as well as the expert courses. So I'm on my way to level two. You can take up to level four where you're doing the line fold test, the smell wine, tell me what year it was made, what's the soil type and everything. You have that, like, again, like you said, that, that complete expert, you have that level. Um, you also have the sommelier route you can take, which is more service driven edge, um, more service driven as far as restaurant quality wise. And then you have your, the course I'm taking, which is more educational. So 
there there are a number of classes they they get expensive um but it's an investment it's you know if, if that's the route you want to go if it's something you want to do there are also you know classes you can take that are for free as well um but again it's applied education which to me has been my route over general education over generalized education I agree. So speaking of uh, applied education, I know it's been a pandemic, but uh, have you gotten to go travel to any of these places? I haven't. And it's funny. I've been to Spain before. I've been to a few places before. We're actually going to California at the end of the month. So that's going to be pretty exciting. But no, um, during the pandemic, like every, like a lot of people, um, you know, they seen business slow down. And that's really the time where I just went and got back to the books and got certified. And, you know, be before that, I would be doing wine festivals, wine shows, wine events. But, you know, once everything slowed down, OK. And I found a few tests, um, a few courses, like I said, that were free. So I went and done those. I studied, made videos, made a lot of my wine videos during that time just to, you know, sort of keep active and stay at it. And so, you know. So are you also... Um studying spirits that aren't wine no so the funny thing is they used to that used to be a requirement now it's just strictly wine um used to be a requirement for level two to do the spirits as well um before people would you know would always come to me oh you should do this this and this too but i just decided to mainly specifically focus on wine not beer not whiskey even though it's kind of interesting to me but just to 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 alleviate from that whole jack of all trades thing i really wanted to master and conquer wine but as again you'll see on my instagram there are a few times where i'm promoting tequila a few few times where you know i'm at the bourbon festival working which, which is fine it fuels it, it you know you use those things to fuel what you really want to do but i just really just put the tunnel vision on wine and and basically nothing else well the uh recently i like i'm in florida so i feel like trends kind of like trickle down you know what i mean from the, the north to the south but uh, a huge trend here right now is a uh, wine that has been aged in bourbon barrels so you know mm -hmm. there's always some kind of crossover it's cool yeah though there, there are a couple of good ones um you know california certain areas of california do a couple of great cabernets because cabernets are strong enough to hold and they'll age them in some will age in kentucky bourbon barrels just for a few to get that taste in. But I mean, that technique is nothing that's, that's not a new technique. You know what I mean? Like you said, it's a trend. And of course with port, you know, alcohol is added to port. So, you know. I love port. There you go. I feel like port, like, I don't know why more people don't drink it. I don't know. This is like, I love port. I think when they find out it's still made with feet, made, the traditional method of people stamping it with their feet. I think they get a little, you know, get a little. The alcohol you know, kills the germs. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> and also, uh, they do that for many Italian wines and, you know, actually a lot of different wines, you know. There's places where, you know, you can go at, like I would love to go and you get to go jump on the grapes. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> part Let of like the vineyard store. It's cool. Well, like I tell um, a lot of my buddies who do cigars, I have a, you know, um, you just, you, you know, you sort of just meet people in different fields and I have a couple of buddies who smoke cigars and always like, what kind of wine to go with? It? Because um, I'm like, oh, you have red wines, you have some Cabernets, but port as well. I tell a lot of people port will go perfect with a cigar. Oh, port goes yeah. great. It's yeah, simple. you get a ruby port, you get a tiny port, maybe even a late bottle vintage port with a nice cigar. And, but we're not here to talk about cigars, but it's, you know, well, all right, I guess we should talk about some wine before we go into this. So one of the things I would love for you to uh, to talk about is, uh, so so how should you read the wine label? Okay. Oh, I wish I had me a wine bottle with me. But, okay, so depends on where you are. There's certain terms. If you have a European wine, the European wines are what we call old world Okay. They won't have the, the title of the wine. They won't say Pinot Noir, Chardonnay, Shiraz, whatever. They will say the estate. So you'd read the estate. They will also say 
you know, the vintage is, is not the year the wine was made. It's the year the grapes were harvested. Right. So you'll see certain terms. And let's, let's make it, again, I don't have a bottle with me. I should probably grab a bottle, but that's professional. But if you, you, you would see it. you have one in, in your house? We can, you know, take a break. Yeah, I don't want to. You want me to go get one? Yeah, go for it. I'm not, I'm not going anywhere. I'll just eat so some tea. commercial tea. break. I'll be right back. All right, well, while Rico's uh, getting a bottle, I'm uh, trying out this cheese. It's on sale at Whole Foods. It's a uh, it's a goat cheese, but it's um it's kind of they said it was like aged like a brie, so well, that was really fast. All right, so I'm bringing a Vina Salinas, which is from this is a Sauvignon Blanc. This is from Chile. It's from Chile. So can you see? All right. Um, it's a little blurry. Let's see. A little blurry. So like a glary, that's the word. There's a glare. Yeah, so I'm gonna change the lighting. Right. So I'm gonna show you something really cool. So it's a little darker in here. Can we see it now? No. Oh man. Well, can I pretend? Sure. <laughs> okay. So. You know, you know what I'll do. Um, mm -hmm. Like, definitely point to it. But after we're done talking, just take a picture of it, and then I'll put it up in the screen in the editing software. Okay. Yeah. So with this, this is a Sauvignon Blanc. This is a New World because it's from Chile. So again, you have New World, you have Old World. New World wines tell you what type of grape it is. Old World wines depends on. They, they like to promote the appellation and the vineyard. The vineyard. Yeah, so the region, too. Right. Yeah. So yeah. this is a new world, but I just want to show you a couple of key terms that you may see. So over here it says Reserva. A lot of people don't understand what Reserva wine is. So the Reserve wine is a batch that was came out of an excellent year that they just held. Okay. So let's say if 2017 was an excellent year, they may have just took the batch and let it, you know, let it sit for a while and brought it out a different time. So that's your reserve. That's so your reserve. Mm -hmm. people listening, what, what means that it was an expert year? That all depends now. See, okay. So that all depends on, on what the grape is, where it was and everything. But when you generally see something that's a reserva, that's a, uh, I don't want to say the best batch, but that's a pretty special batch. Yeah, so the, the, the they thought the conditions for the harvest for the grapes were superb and the grapes came out great. They had the right sugar content and everything like that. They tasted good. Right. So that's what's going to, you know, when people say, oh, you know, it was a good year. They're not talking about like, you know, they made a million dollars that year. They're talking about right. so like, um, farming conditions. <laughs> Right. So like a few of my clients, they may like a particular wine and I'll say, do you like, you know, I may bring them a particular wine. They like it. And I know that one has a, um, has a reserva. I'll say, okay, well now you're going to try the reserva and they're, they're blown away. Yeah. Yeah. So that, that kind of makes it a little special. Just key terms. You'll see reserva. Um, you know, you have the, the alcohol volume, you'll have the vintage. So again, this is not what year the wine was made 2020. It's what year the, the um, harvest it was harvested. You'll see Selection, especially if you're in South America, you may see Selection Especial, which is the special selection. Again, your reserve selection or, you know, your, your better batch, so to speak. Um, and if you're looking at Italian wines, they, they have, they, so again, old world, they have different stages of age, of not just aging, but of quality. You have a, See, this is hard to do without a bottle. But you have an AOC, which is a general in France. Let's see. I'll put a picture of something up there. Yeah, I know what you're talking about. Okay, <laughs> we so, need a label for that one. Yeah, I have one of my old videos, and it was like denominant DOCG. But they have different, mm -hmm. and, and they'll stay on it, which um, which grade it is. Yeah. It won't say A, B, C, or D. It may say DOCG for Italian. And let's say that's 
Denominatie, Denomina, mm, Denominatie Origina um, Contralata Garantifica, meaning it's guaranteed quality. You so you'll see excellent some... pronunciation. Good okay. job. <laughs> Good job. It's been a while because I've been doing so many other ones and I haven't done Italian in a while. Um, and so that's how you would, you know, you pretty much read your, you would read your, your bottle. And, and again, it goes by region because now let's say if we, we had some Rioja from Spain and Spain will have different, they have different categories for their, for their agents. So let's say if we had a Rioja and it says, um, Reserva, it wouldn't mean the same as this, this, you know, in this case, it means Reserva because it's the reserve glad the reserve batch and in Spain, the Reserva means it's been aged a certain period. Okay. Okay. And then you have Grand Reserva, which means it's been aged the longest. Reserva may be two years, two years combination of barrel and bottle. Okay. So it's, it's a whole science behind it. But what I tell people generally, you get a bottle of wine. If you get a wine from, you know, if you, if you don't get a European wine, let's just say if you get a wine from Australia, if you get one from Napa, Oregon, Chile, you're going to be able to read what the grape is. Europe, again, is going to tell you the estate. So True. it's a little tricky. And also, you know, mm. when you were talking about the DOG and AOC and stuff like that, those are, um, for people listening, they're like standards that are not, that are held by the government. That's so, right. So they're uh, by law. <laughs> by law. Um, do you know how the ones in France came about? Do you know the story with that? I don't know that one. Yeah, let me. I don't want to sit here and say, yeah, no, what is it? <laughs> um, so I can't remember when it was, but <laughs> the story goes, um, you know, French wine, this is very popular. Um, but everyone, you know, they, they're trying to make more money no matter what it is. And so some of these winemakers were, they wanted something they added, could add to the wine and like dilute it, right? So yeah. they didn't know this, but uh, they were putting antifreeze in the wine. Oh yeah. yeah because yeah. it has like a sweet flavor, which is not, is toxic. You don't want to eat antifreeze. <laughs> so the regulation standards of French wine came out about because people were getting poisoned with antifreeze. <laughs> that's crazy. They did the same thing with bourbon. I, I believe that. That's a whole nother, yeah, that's a whole nother can of worms. <laughs> wow. <laughs> yeah, and, and you know, the thing I love about wine is that, so, and I always equate this when I was in, when I was in grade school, you know, I didn't do math well, didn't like English much, but I loved history. I loved earth science. I loved, um, I don't want to say poetry, but what is that? Social studies. And so, and Fran and um, wine has all that. Oh yeah. And it's yeah. just, it has so many, like, you know, like that story, mm -hmm. I, I can't remember the dates or anything, but how can you yeah. not remember that story when you like, you know, just learning about wine, they tell you that, you know? Yeah. Remember that story? You know the one about Chianti Classico and Chianti? No. Okay, so in Italy and Tuscany, um, they were fighting over this area, which area would be, you know, considered Chianti Classico. Um, so the two sides were fighting, and so they decided to um, end the dispute with um, roosters crowing. So there was a white rooster and a black rooster, and they were, and it was a night on each end of the town, and so whichever rooster crow crowed the loudest the loudest, that would be the territory. And so the Chianti Classico was a little black rooster that crowed the loudest when the knight heard him riding on his horse. And so that's how, when you see a bottle of Chianti Classico, like right above the label is gonna be a black rooster. Ah, that's cool. <laughs> that's diplomacy, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's so Italian too. <laughs> An Italian thing to do. I can say that because I'm Italian. <laughs> but, um, that's great. Uh, cool. So we kind of went over that. That's good. 
I think that's a good thing. But with the French wine, there's also there's AOC and there's there's a couple other grades too, though. Yeah. So. And that. That brings me to my other uh, discussion. Um, price, right? Mm -hmm. So I don't, you know, I don't make that much money. Is you know, get people to subscribe so I can make some money. Right. <laughs> but <Subscribe. laughs> you know, so I can buy tell a friend. Tell a friend. One. So, what would you say are uh, good price ranges for good wine? It depends on what you want. I mean, and and, and one thing about me again, not just advertising Rico's Wine Adventure, where I help you select a perfect wine for every occasion, and you can find me on Instagram and Facebook. But I like to find a diamond in the rough. But there, you know, it, it's subjective because you can find a great twenty dollar bottle of wine. You can find a great ten dollar bottle of wine. You can find a really bad fifty dollar bottle of wine. It, it all depends on the location. And I think, like we touched on it off air people will go for it with the prettiest bottle. And that's not necessarily the most efficient way. So I tell people to just, you know, do your research. What do you like? Try a few blends the first time and, and whatever great, you, whatever you like about the blend, let's say if it has, you know, 70% Merlot, try Merlot. Then you like the Merlot. Okay, let's, let's get a bottle. Maybe I'll get, I'll start with a $50 bottle and, you know, work my way up or work my way down. General rule is, and I hope I'm not all over the place with the response, but general rule is if it's under a hundred dollars, if, it if it's under a hundred dollars, you drink it away, you know, you drink it. Um, if it's over a hundred dollars, then you want to store it and you want to save it. Yeah. So I think I want to drink it if it's over a hundred dollars too. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Before well, anyone well, finds well, out that I had some. <laughs> but you know, um, you know, wine is so awesome. And and I mean, let's say you got a few, you know, and I tell people this is a this is a trick. I really like your show. So I'm telling you and your listeners. So let's say you have an, an exclusive bottle and you buy three or four, let's see, Bordeaux or whatnot. Not a Bordeaux superior, but if you buy a nice couple of nice Bordeaux and you put them up in your, your closet somewhere where it's dark and crampy and you don't touch it for 10 years, it may end up becoming a $200 bottle of wine. It's a it's a 60, 40 chance. You know, after 10 years of aging, especially you have a great, um, especially if it comes out of great harvest, you have your $200 bottle. You just maybe took you 10 years to get it. So at what point mm -hmm. would my $200 bottle of wine become a $200 bottle of vinegar? It all, it, it ooh, I hate to give that quote. I, keep, I feel like I keep saying it all depends. So if, again, like we talked Spanish wines earlier, Spanish wines are aged already to go. They've already been regulated and aged. So when you get a Spanish wine, you drink it right away. If you were to get a hundred dollar bottle of Spanish wine aged for 10 years, it would be vinegar. Um, what it is with the wines, um, are you familiar with tannins? Yeah. Okay. So but people listening might not be. <laughs> yeah. So tannins are the bitters. That's that dry tea, that, that thing that makes your teeth feel like fuzzy slippers. If that wine is so strong and bitter and makes you pucker up, that's when you want to age it. If that wine is smooth and easy and drinkable, it's ready to drink. Don't age a wine that's drinkable. You want that wine, like um, you're Italian, so Barolo and Barbaresco, yep. which are really, really strong, you know, wines. You want to take those and age them for 10 years. So, but but if you have a wine and, and you, you know, it's low on tannins and it's easier to drink now, then drink it and enjoy it. So the... Trying to remember what that was called. The metal one. Malaric reaction? That's something to do with apples. I got is what it, it mellows it out. Trying, I can't remember from wine school. Yeah, the agent mellows out the tannins. Yeah. So yeah. the another interesting fact mm -hmm. that I learned in pastry school, not not in wine class, um, is that <laughs> Uh, do you know what cream of tartar is? No, give me that. What's that? So cream of tartar is, um, it's a, like an acidic powder. It's white and you use mm -hmm. it in like baking all the time. Like usually a tiny, tiny amount of it because it's so acidic. Um, but it turns out that's actually, um, 
a powdered form of grape skins. Oh, wow. Which I had no idea. And I was like, well, that's pretty cool. So definitely that's why tannins are like, <laughs> but uh, I'm a fan of tannins. So why don't we talk about the wine making process then since we're going into tannins. Cause some okay. people are like, I don't like tannins. <laughs> so <laughs> tannins give me a headache. How many time have you heard, times have you heard that one? I've heard that a lot. And then also I ask people, you know, where, where, and which way are you drinking your wine? You know, it, and I'm like, a, are they giving you a headache as you're drinking it? Or is it the next morning that you have the headache? But, but I mean, also, did you decant your wine? Did you let your wine breathe? Did you just open the cork and start drinking it? Um, no, there are a lot of different key factors. Are yeah. you eating a nice meal with it? Are you pairing it right? Because, you know, that, that makes a big difference. That wine can elevate or destroy your meal. True. Yeah. So... I'm trying to, there's a lot, there's a lot to cover right there. <laughs> um, <laughs> let's see, there's, okay, so why don't we talk about, do you want to give like a quick overview of like the wine making process? Like if I was going to make a red wine, like, you know, let's just say. Okay, so yeah, they come from the darker grapes, the red, so the red grapes or black grapes, they call them as well. And, you know, you would crush them, you would keep the skin on them, which is how you would get the color. I know you, again, we talked off air and a lot of people didn't realize that. And that's how they, they keep the color. Um, you would keep it out the light. It depends on, again, which region you, your, which region you're in, you would age it in a oak barrel or a steel barrel, or even a concrete egg. And concrete egg. I haven't heard that one yet. Yeah. Really? No. Yeah. Um, Georgia, the country, not yeah. not the country Georgia. Hey, you know the country Georgia, but not this the that's the state. Um, yeah, concrete. Um, Portugal does that as well. Okay. You give me a quiz over here, man. I'm sorry. I'm no, sorry. I love it. I feel it. like I'm it. interrogating you a little bit. I, I want to. you to like relax a little bit. <laughs> no, because you know what happens. You learn so much stuff, and then you know once you get on a new lesson, you forgot. You're like, oh, I forgot how to learn that. Oh, so I this, forget. It's okay. I forget yeah. everything. That's why I like, I know the mallory, mallory, that's going to drive me nuts. I'm going to wind up looking well, at Malolactic acid. Yeah. There's some kind of a reaction that like yeah. makes it, I mean, you know, that reaction is used is like a lot. There's a lot of things that thing does in like cooking, but it's particular to wine. Um, they cause that reaction for something to do with. Yeah. It's mostly a um, few white wines. Yes. Yes, white wines. Yes. That was it. Um, let me see what else, as far as the wine making, just a quick overview. So again, we talk port and- oh, All of port. a sudden, your uh, air conditioning is going crazy. Oh, I apologize. Okay, is that better? Yep. Okay, so again, so we're talking red wines. A rosé is actually, um, rosé is a French word for pink. A lot of people didn't know that. And rosé is, um, the same thing you would take your red wines, I mean, your red grapes, but you would only keep the, 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 the skins in temporarily just to get a little color. So this and just, it's kind of like making a little tea, like, right, right. The there you go. In, the stronger it is. Right. There you go. Yeah. Perfect. <laughs> right. So, yeah. So that's, that's how you would get your rosé. Because a lot of people are like, well, how are rosés pink? Do they boil the, the grapes? And I've, I've, you know, I've heard a ton of questions. A lot, another thing people don't realize is that there, there is no red Zinfandel. It's white Zinfandel is, is basically rosé. And so people say, what's the difference between red Zinfandel and white Zinfandel? No, it's white Zinfandel because it, it, they call it white because it's a rosé. But even though it appears red, Yeah, so a lot of people. Is there a label that says red Zinfandel? No. Just no? Call okay, it's just people saying I've, I've never seen one, but people always, well, it's white. Why does it say white Zinfandel? And I get that question all the time. Um, What else do we have? We are, okay. Oh, we're talking about port. So. Oh, wait. So once you have the skins in the um thing, you take it out when you feel like it's 
you know, you're good, right? Um, Say that, yeah. Some of them, sorry. Someone was calling. So uh, the uh, the ferment fermentation process happens. I can't remember. It happens with the gra grape skins in it, or you strain it and then you you put the you uh, start the fermenting process. So again, it depends on red and white. So red is always crush. Um, what do I call this? Crush, press, ferment. White grapes, you take the skin out before you start to ferment. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then you get the juices out. Yeah. The fermenting. Can and yeah, There's so a vat at some point. I'm sorry. Excuse you me. You said what now? Okay, so yeah, I kind of wanted to go through the whole process so this way people who never, you know, a lot of people have no idea. Um, so you the white wine, you take the skins out. Mm -hmm. Red ones, sometimes you leave it in. For um, red? Yeah. yeah, no, you keep the skins in for red. And at what point mm -hmm. do you, because there's like, there's kind of like a bulk ferment, right? Before it goes mm -hmm. into the barrels, right? Mm -hmm. So how much, how long does that take? That depends on, that's going to depend on the wine and where you are. Okay. Um, because some, they, they would, you know, they have the big, some areas, especially in Europe, they have the big wooden, um, wooden tanks where they'll keep them in and they just, you know, put them in barrels. And it just, um, the interesting thing is like, they all have different techniques. Like for instance, Sherry, like for instance, with Sherry will be the, the smaller, um, wooden barrels and I'll pour a little in one, pour a little in the other, pour a little in the other. And so that it, they try to keep it consistent where there's a little batch from every and it kind of almost like a trickle down effect. Does that make sense? No. Okay. Well, <laughs> <laughs> so they have every, I'll, I'll say this. Every place has that every every place has their own um, techniques. For instance, um, you know, in the United States, in the winery where I work, we may keep it in let's say a week, if that, before we're doing, before we're producing. So it, it, it depends. And if you do a traditional method or if you're doing any of these newer methods. So do, when we talk about port wine, because I always knew it was, you know, fortified with more alcohol. Right. Um, what, what is yeah. that alcohol? It's brandy. So okay. oh, that's why basically, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so yeah, and it, so that's why you get that 19%. So France and England had issues. France and England had issues and France decided they were no longer going to supply England with wine. And so England decided they would use Portugal. However, by the time it came from Portugal to England, the wine was sort of was rotten, had sort of, you know, been foul. And so they decided to put brandy in so that the wine would, would, it would take longer for it to age by the time it got to England. It was, you know, received in England. Because the but alcohol would kill the germs. 19% spiked in alcohol. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> I mean, that's also why it's so good. <laughs> <laughs> why the glasses are so small. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, yeah, I feel like port wine, like, what, what was the first alcoholic beverage you've ever had? You mean of legal age? No, nobody oh. has their. <laughs> no. Show my mom might be watching this. Um... <laughs> Ooh, good question. Oh man, I, I I guess just a beer. Just a beer. I want to say yeah. Beer. I think just a beer. Yeah. It's always always some uncle. First one. one. Sneaking and of course, sneaking. you know it was disgusting. Oh yeah. Uh, yeah, it was a little Budweiser can. All right, here's a better um, question. What's the first one that you had that you actually enjoyed? Where you weren't like, oh. This is even more embarrassing. <laughs> got, got in college and I really like the Mike's Hard Lemonade. Right. Yeah. Pretty much if you ask anybody, it's always something sweet. Yeah. Right? Yeah. When you're not used to that alcoholic sting, 
You need that sugar exactly. to cover it up. So like people will tell me, that oh, cheese is really good. People will tell me that um, I don't like wine, right? And I'm like, well, you haven't had like, you just haven't found one you liked yet because they, they're so different, you know, all across the board. And I feel like poor wine would be like the perfect college wine. <laughs> <laughs> too much and nobody does anything like that i was like come on america that's you know that's my uh culinary college thinking but um high in alcohol super sweet what more can you want exactly <laughs> um but yeah so do you when people are first coming into drinking wine do you tend to rec uh, recommend sweeter wines or what do you think? Funny thing is, I really don't. I really recommend blends, uh, sort of sweet blends, but you just gave me an excellent idea, you know, speaking of ports. I never thought to introduce people to ports. I've always said, try red blend, try a nice sweet red blend. Well, the mm -hmm. maybe port might be a little, because that is the alcoholic bite on some of them is very strong, for sure. Um, the first port I had, I didn't like because it was... I think it was just too cheap and like <laughs> I don't even know if it was like port or just like port like port from Portugal or it was just like port style because that has its own you know yep like champagne is has to be from France port has that's to be right. from Portugal so that's a you know it has its own little seal and everything so no, no, it's funny that you mentioned that. You know, that was actually a lawsuit back in the 70s about champagne. And so that's why you may see some before that they, they were able to be grandfathered in. So that's why you may see some wines that say California champagne. They're still able to use that name pre that lawsuit. Ah, mm -hmm. true, because it's just sparkling wine. It's not mm -hmm. from champagne. There you go. What's your favorite sparkling wine? My favorite sparkling wine. Or one you probably don't have a favorite, but like, I'm sure because you're like me, where you kind of like, you go on a kick, you know? Yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah. But I think my favorite too consistently has been a Prosecco Superiore, mm -hmm. um, and just because I like to make mimosas with it, personally, not just for the taste itself, but just for the bubbles and you know the consistency and the, the heaviness and so. I prefer that. And I also, I'm a big fan. This is from France. This is an ice wine, the ice edition, Francois Moutin. It's a Blanc de Blanc, which means white of whites, white grapes, white wine from white grapes. And man, talk about like, there's so much to talk about. Talk about ice wine. Yeah. <laughs> you guys tell people what uh, ice wine is. Yes. Yeah, so it's, it's, these are the grapes that are picked, which are still um, in the winter. So they're frozen. And what happens is because the grapes are frozen, there's not only higher acidity, but there's a higher level of sweetness. And there you go, because they've been frozen. So the juice is just stuck in there and they haven't. Um, they are just, I don't know, but the ice wines are just really good. <laughs> oh, they're so good. I had one from this vineyard where I can't, it might be Northern California or it might be might even be Canada. I'm not sure. Um, you might have been like Canada, New York, upstate New York. Yeah. And yeah, a lot of ice wines out there. Oh, so they were so good. So good. And then I had another one that I don't remember what grape it was, but it was from California. It was EO, EOS was the name of the vineyard, I think, for the winery. And um, the... It was called Tears of Dew, was like the name of the wine. If you ever have a chance to try it. Okay, it is the most like apricot-y like dessert wine I've ever had. But I really liked to use that when I was like had a pair of desserts and stuff. Yeah. Okay. If you're just looking for one. Check that out. It's got like a baby angel on the bottle. But <laughs> yeah. I appreciate all these wine tips I'm getting. I really love this. It's a great interview where I get to learn. Because, I mean, 
teach me a lot too. I'm getting, I can't wait to tell people about the uh, the rooster story. There you go. <laughs> um, what was I gonna say? So I want to hear your perspective on what do you do to pair uh, wines with food? Because as a chef, like I think every chef has their own or every you know idea of like how to do it because we you know we're you know trying to tell a story let's put it that way mm. yeah for me so again with everything in my style i like to go not necessarily against the grain but i just like to find a diamond in the rough and i like to just to you know part of my rico's wine adventure I'm not going to do it, but part of my Rico's wine adventure is just <laughs> <laughs> where we help you select the perfect wine for every occasion. No, but, but it's like, just... Hold on. I'm sorry to interrupt you, but the adventure part, like, do you plan on doing tours or something soon? So the adventure is basically my story of how I just got started and just all the, the calamities and just everything, the whole start, love, and fight of the whole thing. It's the, you know, having to do a wine show somewhere the same time there's a random um parade which actually happened taking a bus out in northern virginia and then the bus drivers are on strike and then you know being stranded out there it's just this is everything that came with it everything at you know after I, it's, it's you know it's just this journey like you gotta love this you gotta love it it's you know the money's pretty good out of what you just have to love doing this so that's why i just call it rico's wine adventure because it's, it's been the craziest stuff I mean, you can't just gloss over a story like that and then not tell the story. Like, <laughs> <laughs> so the the craziest thing is that, again, I'm from the D.C. area, right? And we call our area DMV, and it's D.C., Maryland, and Virginia. We're we're all pretty, you know, uh, like a like a regular tri-state area. If something's going on in Virginia, you know about it. Something's going on in Maryland, we know about it. Yeah. And and had no idea about this random. Um, strike where the train and the, the bus operators were, were having and I end up getting out getting ready for this show and I'm like okay I've been you know I've took this route before and all of a sudden I'm like okay it's getting a little late okay and everyone's like yeah there's a strike I'm like what do you mean it's a strike how long have they been striking for an hour what <laughs> so you know and then having a bus driver who they had to get volunteer or uh, not volunteer, but they had to get um. I guess I'll say they're B team bus drivers, and you know he didn't know where he was going. <laughs> and, yeah, they didn't know the route, and you know it's, it's it's again it's just been an adventure running to you know a few old um grade school teachers and oh, cool. selling them wine and you know and hearing about them and it's just been fun. It's been fun. It's been a lot of headache, a lot of reading, and you know just just everything. It's just been an adventure. What um. You got any good stories from selling your uh, grade school teachers? What? Um, just coming in and you know I'm seeing Miss Mitchell, Miss Robinson. They're like, who, who are you? This, this random guy. Like, oh my, and, and you know, and wow, you do wine now, yeah. And, you know, and selling them a few bottles of wine, and then them, I you know, and then they're bragging. One of my students, you know, he wasn't a better, he wasn't, he wasn't a student, but one of my students is now, he's a wine salesman. He's a wine such and such. And, and you know, and, you know, they're calling me or emailing me, hey, I've got a question about what goes with this, which is pretty awesome. So how do you formulate uh, what goes with what? Again, um, I try to break what I would consider the traditional rules. I still like to go from, you know, what's the main dish, what's the protein, what's the meat? And I work from around that. Um, if you're having a salad, then of course, you know, I'll, I'll switch that up. But um, let's, I'll give you an example, one of my biggest examples. So the, the, the main understanding is when you have a steak, you have um, Cabernet, Cabernet Sauvignon, Cab Sav, whatever you want to call it. I, for one reason, I said, no, that, that, no. Um, let's think about this. Let's go mile back. And why would I go mile back? Because, well, Argentina is known for their steaks. Hell yeah. Yeah, see? And so in their top region is Mendoza. So I'll say, okay, we're going to get a mile back from Mendoza from their top region. It's going to pair one for the state. 
for maybe a little less than a Cabernet. That $30 Cabernet versus a $14 um, Malbec. Yeah. So that's 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 kind of my thinking. Even any and, and even um, let's say, okay, as a matter of fact, let's do a smoky Pinot Noir. Let's throw another curve. Let's let, yeah, let's do I a California like Pinot, Pinot Noir. Pinot. There's a Pinot Noir for every dish. <laughs> like <laughs> that's what I feel about Pinot Noir. Like you like Pinot Noir, like the lighter ones, they go great with fish. You know, you don't yeah. to have like a white wine with fish or something, or you know, chicken or something like that. Like they're so versatile like i always tell people you don't know what kind of wine to get just grab a pinot noir <laughs> yeah and so for pinot they have that reputation of being too light for red meat no no you get a smoky pinot noir you find a california and you get those hints of smoke in there and you're enjoying your meal um you're going to do lamb chops okay let's find a nice Merlot that's going to go with it. And I, and, and I want to sort of match the wine so it doesn't take away from the meal. Because, you know, I understand the art of uh, and the preparation of being a chef. I could never become it, but I understand it. So for you all, I don't want to take away from your dish. I want to add to the dish. And so if in most cases, if you get something too, too strong, too abstract, it takes away from that dining experience. So I want a wine that's going to complement it. Right. So I think, um, mm -hmm. you know, for the listeners too, if, if you're, there's, it's, I feel like it's kind of hard to like really like tear, like if you fuck up like the wine with the meal, like you really have to try sometimes, you know? Yeah. And, um, so I always say like, when I'm thinking about what wine I want to put with my meal, I'm either thinking in terms of like contrast where mm -hmm. like if I'm eating something super greasy, right? Mm -hmm. um, maybe like a burger or something or a steak, then then I'm going to go with like a, maybe a drier wine and it's a steak. So that's a heavy, it's a heavier protein and more heavy flavor. So then I'm going for a heavier wine, right? And even in viscosity too you know, not just uh, flavor, but if I'm going to go, because if I do something acidic with something fatty, that acid's going to cut through the fat and it's going to allow me to actually taste my food better. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that's a really good contrast, but sometimes, especially in dessert wine, right, you're just looking for something complimentary. So if I have a dish that is a strawberry um strawberry cheesecake right mm -hmm. then i'm all right how do i complement it i really you know you could contrast it you could go either way but you know in the realm of dessert wine it's usually easier to uh compliment you know <laughs> and elevate elevate by complimenting rather than elevate by contrasting so maybe i'll go for like um a wine that has hints of strawberry in it, right? Because I got mm -hmm. strawberry in my cheesecake. Um, but I could also, you could also contrast and maybe go for something because the cheesecake is super sweet. And then you also have the cheesecake part. That's the fatty part. Maybe you go something a little lemony, you know, because then you have that contrast. Um, so I think in terms of what you're like as a generalization it's good to be like oh you know merlot steak mm -hmm. you know what i mean but when you actually go and you start tasting bottles you know then you can really be like oh these flavors work really well with this you know if i made this with it as a chef that's kind of how i try to think about it okay so i don't know if that's weird or not but <laughs> No, oh, that makes that makes total sense though. That makes total sense. Another thing, um, when it comes to desserts, I rarely use a dessert wine with it. I like to do a demi sec sparkling wine. Because demi sec means um sort of sweet. Yeah. Not all the way sweet. Not all the way. And for me, right. So for me it's allow allows you to clear your palate. It's 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 less dry, it's drinkable, and it elevates that dessert. So let's say if we're having cupcakes and you have a sparkling demi sec. you can have the, you know, you have a toast or whatever, let's say it's a nice birthday party, whatever the case is, or whatever, if you don't want to just eat the cake, 
Then you have that demi sec, which you can drink, and it's sort of sweet. It has the bubbles, clears the palate. Boom. You know what was crazy? I just I had a couple, maybe like a year ago, um, which apparently a lot of people know about this wine. It's not that crazy, but um, I forgot the name of it. It starts with an L. But it's a sparkling, it's a sweet sparkling red wine. And it comes from Russia or something. Oh. It seems like the uh, kind of like the, you know, like the Czech Republic, you know, like Slavic areas. Okay. Um, they have a lot of sparkling red wines. They're like really cool. I don't know if you've ever had them. <laughs> Oh, thank you. Maybe check it out. Yeah, uh, I've had a few from, like I said, from the, the nation of Georgia, which are fantastic. Yeah, there's so many. It's like every, everywhere where there's like dirt, like everywhere grapes grow, there's a wine. <laughs> you know, have you, the one thing I really thought was interesting when I um, was studying wine was um the history with uh phylloxera did you mm -hmm. read about that yes ma'am i think yeah that's so crazy it still blows my mind um you want to talk a little bit about that for people listening yeah that was the disease in the 19th century which knocked out a lot of areas long story short and a lot of the poor areas the poor european nations they were hit the hardest from it and so other areas, um, basically, it was a big fungus that just destroyed the vines, not just the grapes, but the vines as well. And it um, it made growing grapes extremely hard. Um, it also destroyed and, and, and entered the land as well. And so a lot of eight, a lot of nations, France, um, Italy were able to bounce back. But again, a lot of the poor nations. Um, South Africa took a major hit. Um, Georgia, Bulgaria, yeah. those areas took big, took bigger hits. And um, they're just now, actually just now within the last, let's say 40, 50 years are still, you know, trying to resurge from it. Well, you know, reputation yeah. and everything. So for, so the, the disease phylloxera, what it did was it attacked the rootstock. Mm -hmm. So, and you know, good old America, we brought it over to Europe. <laughs> so, um, so what they wound up doing is for all, the, because it was just attacking the rootstock, uh, they wound up grafting. So they wound up sowing the old vine on top of an American rootstock that was resistant to the phylloxera. But they found out that phylloxera, uh, the regions it didn't hit, um, were because they were higher in altitude and the phylloxera couldn't survive up there. So when you do drink these South American wines that are from Chile and stuff like that, that are high up in the mountains, they're actually the old rootstock, which is pretty cool because then you're actually drinking a lot of these wines, these vines, I should say, were it, imported from Europe. So you're mm -hmm. drinking relatives of the original wines which is cool but of course uh, you know the one thing people i feel like you're gonna when you go to california <laughs> you've been to california though before right i think uh, we were young we're really really young not okay. not old enough to enjoy it all right so when you can go get drunk in california um uh, <laughs> the mm. uh I didn't have this experience with wine, actually. I had it with a beer. I can't remember the name of the beer. It might be like Anchor or something. It's got a star on it and an anchor. Mm -hmm. It's a brown ale. But that beer tastes like the place it's from. Wow. Like when you start traveling and tasting mm -hmm. different wines and stuff, mm -hmm. like when they, t they use this term terroir, I think it's just the French word for like territory. <laughs> Oh no! It's um, it's um, sorry. It's it's the it's how the vine interacts with the environment, right? But there is a term. It, it's it's a it's a term. It's not known well called greed, which is what you just said, describing like how a, a place is. 
Is that um, what language is that? It's French. It's called Greek. It's, Greek. it's like southern. Yeah, a little region of southern France uses that, that term, Greek. Okay. Which basically what you just said, like it, it, it tastes like the place it's from. Yeah. So all these things, mm -hmm. not just wine, have this character, and that like that's one of the coolest things about. Um, I don't know, like, if you watched any of my channel stuff, but um, I was working. Yeah, I love the ice cream episode. The <laughs> ice cream, cool. yeah. Yo, know, talk about kicks. I've been making ice creams, like, since that episode. Like. <laughs> and that nacho, what was that? The nacho. Um, oh, the nacho dilla? Is that it? The one you were saying for the Super Bowl and you cut that big slice? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's a. Uh... Yeah, that was me. That's Noel. That's my boyfriend. He's so funny. Yeah, he makes those videos way better. He's way funnier than me. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, he's a uh, yeah, he's a uh, trainer to be aircraft mechanic. So he's in Tennessee right now, uh, taking his test. Wow. Um, so I'm excited for him. But uh, yeah, what was I gonna say? <laughs> talking about the beer. The star. Oh, we're talking about the beer. Uh, the terroir. I don't know why, why I brought up my channel. Too much wine. I'm talking about the ice cream guy. I'm talking about the ice cream guy. But I was going to say something before that. I don't remember. <laughs> you said, yeah, but you were telling me about the beer in California. You said when I'm able yeah. to drink it. Oh, so the, well, the, the terroir. Anchor. I don't know. You're going to make me look for that beer. We have to write that down in the description. I have to find that beer. It's like, it's not that, it's not a, uh, it's not like a super crazy beer, but I just remember being where it was. And I'm like, this, you know, it really does like the, you know, when you go to different places, like the air smells different. You know what I mean? It's, it's just like when you drink that beer, I was like, I, and I didn't think about it when I was there, but when I had left and I found that beer and like, I was in Philly. So I went, um, when I had it again, when I was in Philly, I was like, whoa, this really, like, this is from there, you know? Like it was, it was like, boom. <laughs> um, so that's really cool. Like when you go to California, you'll get to, to have that experience. So uh, what part of California are you going to go to? We're going to be in San Diego. All right. Southern that's California. So, so Cal. I haven't been to San Diego yet. So are you going to be a, uh, a, a bud tender and a uh, sommelier? <laughs> <laughs> no, um, I think we're just really... You know, just going to stick to doing some festivals and doing some shows and just really just sticking to the educational side of wine. I really enjoy that. I mean, yeah. pairing it with your favorite uh, cannabis is going to definitely be the next uh, iteration <laughs> of. <laughs> yeah, they're doing, they're doing a lot of stuff with wine if I'm using it, but my mentor, she would kill me. <laughs> <laughs> Traditionalist, yeah. So, how did you meet your mentor? Doing the, um, actually my first wine show, like I said, the guy, Paul Carey asked me to head out and I headed out to Virginia and she was there. And the first thing she said, man, you smell really good, but the wine must smell better. People have to smell the, the wine over your cologne. And she went and brought me a book and she just, um, showed me how to open the bottles and how to hold it and everything. Just, just really like motherly. That's awesome. That's yeah. fine. <laughs> Very motherly. We just got you with that backhanded compliment real quick. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so again, you know, I'll um message her, hey Miss Pam, I just um I just have this, you know, this cert certification from XYZ. She's like, Great, what's the next one? Great, continue on. You know, so it's it's a minor pat on the back and it's like keep going. So let's go ahead. Which wine have you found the most um, interesting so far that you've taken a course on? Um, hmm. Which wine have I found the most interesting? 
So currently, I'm taking Vindi Rioja, which is my diploma in Spanish wines and for Rioja, just that specific region, Northwest Spain. And so their um, wine for the Rioja is Tempranillo. That's that's the that well, that's the grape, the Tempranillo grape, but the wine is called Rioja. So that's just been interesting. Um, I thought I knew a lot about it beforehand. And once I get to study it in depth, I'm like, wow, okay. I didn't know that. <laughs> you know, certain things that the difference between the American oak and the French oak and some of the Spanish wines use a combination. Oh, they're going to age it a couple months in French and then a couple months in American oak and, and why and, you know. So I think the more I study that particular region in depth, I'm just finding out new things. And, you know, to be completely honest, I said, oh, I've, I've studied temperate, I've studied Rioja, I've sold it a million times, I've, you know, I have it in my Italian notes, so I have a general overall understanding, and I wasn't even close. Happens a lot. Mm -hmm. um, and that's a good, uh, thing to talk about, too, is that, uh, that grape, they grow it in other places, you know, mm -hmm. so like, it does get complicated with the, with the labeling, <laughs> you know, because, uh, you know, uh, Bordeaux is Chardonnay and Cabernet Sauvignon, or which one? No, Bordeaux's are mainly um, Merlot and Cabernet. And that's um, long, so, yeah. but they have white Bordeaux. They do have white Bordeaux. Well, then, it's like there's always like a red grape and then a white grape, right? That's so the, the the well, the white grapes their own separate selection. Bordeaux are mainly Merlot, uh, Merlot and Cabernet. Merlot and Cabernet. Mm -hmm. And then you have, um, like I said, when you talk France, you have other regions where you know you're allowed certain grapes in it. Like the Chateau Neuf de Pop contains 13 different grapes. Yeah. Chateau of the Pot? Chateau. You're everything in the pot? What? <laughs> yeah. That's, they yeah. just threw everything in the pot. That's what it's called. There you go. Hey. <laughs> uh, no, but really, what's it called? Chateau Neuf de Pop. Okay. I don't mm -hmm. know what that means. That means the ninth point. chateau of the Pope, where the Pope lived. Because again, you know, when you talk in Europe, uh, it's Appalachians. It's there that that region, not the great. Wait, where the Pope lived? So Italy? No, it was. I guess they had a Pope in France, but that's what they call it, Chateau of the Pope. I know. I don't know. What's well, time? Like the Vatican <laughs> over here. <laughs> I wonder, does the Vatican have its own wine? Church wine. <laughs> I don't know. There could be a market there. <laughs> what? what who makes who makes the church wine? That's a good question. I never thought about that until this moment. <laughs> I don't know. Uh. Certain wines I know they would get from monks and stuff, and they would make them in Europe. But I don't know. Oh yeah, so many of the monks made wine. Even you know, don't. Dom Perignon was a, oh, I never plugged in my fucking computer. Um, but yeah, Dom, Dom Perignon was a, a, a monk, I believe. Yeah. I got to go to his monastery once. That was cool. That's in France. One second. Luckily, I wore pants. Well, a dress today. So, you know. Um, so um yeah so much of wine history is like religious it's pretty cool it's pretty interesting um it's the green sorry what was that i said religion war governments disagreeing yeah. How do you feel? Because you know what really, really grinds my gears, <laughs> um, which I understand the need for it kind of sort of, but mm -hmm. the capacity, the control, the amount of control it has, especially like 
where I'm from in New Jersey. And mm -hmm. like every state has its own liquor board and they can run it at whatever the way they want. And like, so I'm from New Jersey. And when I went to school in Philly, in Pennsylvania, the idea that you could go into a pizzeria and also buy a beer, like blew my mind. <laughs> I don't know what it's like in Maryland, but in New Jersey, to get any alcohol, you have to go to the liquor store and they're mm. all have to be licensed by the liquor board. So it's the whole Ponzi scheme, but also not only do they control what place you buy your alcohol, but they control what alcohols you're allowed to buy in that state. Oh, wow. And especially for Pennsylvania, because I remember like you have to, you have to get your alcohol on the list. So if you're a small producer of wine or something and you can't like lobby to get your wine into the sta state of Pennsylvania, like good luck, you know, mm. it's, I don't, it's not great. I understand having safety standards, of course, but right. if you, uh, you know, to have these kind of arbitrary lists and stuff is not a, always made me go, hmm, because I'd find a wine I'd like to try or something on the internet, or I, I'd see it in like Wine Spectator, Spectator magazine or whatever. Uh -huh. And then um, I would ask my uh, professor like, Hey, can we get this wine? He's like, oh no, not in, not in Pennsylvania. <laughs> wow. I'm like, fuck. Yeah. Do they have that? What is it like in Maryland? Um, I can only speak from like the consumer standpoint. Um, and I'll say, so years ago in Washington D.C., you couldn't buy on Sundays. Couldn't purchase alcohol on Sundays. You'd have to come across the street into Maryland, basically, and purchase. Um, now I think it's it's so in Washington D.C. A few of the grocery stores they have they have wine, they have beers. Um, not too many hard liquors, but uh, wine and beers. Yeah. In Maryland, in Prince George's County, where I live, no, but in other counties, some counties they do. It 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 depends by counties. When I'm in Northern Virginia, and this is where this is where like I see the biggest change. Northern Virginia, the wine stores only sell wine and beer. And then you have to go to an ABC store to get liquor. Okay. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's so, kind of like what it's like in Florida, where you have you have wine and beer in the grocery stores or whatever. Okay. And then hard liquor is in like a liquor store type thing, like ABC Liquors or mm -hmm. whatever it is. Or even sometimes like the grocery store has like a little store attached to it that's the liquor store. Right. Okay. I think Costco does that too. Costco is a great place to buy uh, expensive wine on sale. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. And here in Maryland, where I live, Prince George's County, the Costco's don't have alcohol. But again, if you drive down five, 10, 15 minutes, Washington, D.C., the Costco has alcohol. Huh. Mm -hmm. Interesting. What's your favorite places to go buy wine? Again, I like the diamond in the rough. So I'll go to even some of the sketchiest liquor stores and I'm like, oh my God, you have this? And they're like, oh uh, yeah, I guess. <laughs> like I don't, you know, because you, you, you have the wine stores, the big chain stores, and they'll have, you know, I don't like, they'll have celebrity wines, they'll have their wines as well. But I always like, again, especially when I'm personal buying, when I'm uh, private buying for people, I just like to go into many different stores and just see, you know, what they have. So that's that's sort of my favorite thing. That's my niche. I love because, um, going to the mom and pop ones. Yeah. yeah, because again, you know, their their biggest sale may be lottery and Hennessy or whatever, um, you know, tequila, whatever the case is. And I may find, you know, one day I think I found um what did I find? Vanilla de Montepulciano. And I was like, what? Wow. You guys have this here? I feel like those are the people like that they get into it and then they, um, you know, they either stock it for themselves because they have to buy a case or something in order to meet the minimum requirement or uh, 
you know, that they, they know like, oh, I can have this niche market because the big box stores aren't going to do it. Right. So, which is, you know, yeah. So again, my whole, through my whole Rico's Wine Adventure has just been the diamond in the rough. Yeah. Diamond in the rough. Like this, this is actually the first South African wine I've ever had. Really? Yeah. Because it's turning bright red, though. And it's because I had to turn off the air conditioning, not because I'm drunk. <laughs> so I want to make that clear. But uh, South African wine. So what is cool about South, South, Af South African wine? Um, you know, their, their big grape is Pinot Sage, which um is a blend of pinot noir and ooh, 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 ooh. it's a blend it contains pinot noir i'm just going to say that but it's not as accepted all over the world so it's pretty much just in that area but south african wine um their big their big university and their big um area stalinbach there is where they their cape um they make some fantastic wines they're fantastic. They have fantastic Cabernets, some great Pinot Noirs. They have some great Chardonnays as well. And so, um, and it's funny because for years South Africa had terrible wines because they weren't able to um, use to use specific areas for growing. And it wasn't until when Nelson Mandela came in power and ended apartheid where they were able to use different areas to grow, and the wine became better consequently. <laughs> Well, a lot of things come, you know, a lot of things get better when, uh, you know, segregate the population. Great. Very important. So, but definitely the wine, you know. Yeah. And they have their own sparkling called Cape Classy, which is really good. They have, um, they actually, um, they have their fortified wines as well, which is like port as well. Oh, okay. Is that? Yeah. Called, um, what is it? Mead? It's, I think it's called mead or neat. Well, mead is honey wine. Okay, so that may not be it. So. But, um, hmm. yeah, South African wines are definitely They works. might have a honey wine, too. You never know. Hmm. I didn't think of the name of that. It's been a couple of months. You have that memorize, 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 and then. Yeah, because, again, <laughs> you learn so much information coming in. And then, you know, each each wine region has different set of rules. Yeah. Set of rules. So things that apply in South Africa don't apply in Spain. And the things that apply in Spain don't apply in um, Italy. And then Chile and so on. That's true. So is there anything else you want to tell me about the adventure? Um, yeah, again, you can find me on Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn, working on the website. And again, um, you know, I'll be posting some more videos, more tutorial videos as well. Um, look forward to doing a second interview with you, hopefully. Yeah, I mean, we I feel like we talked about like, like way too many things in like such a short period of time <laughs> that you're gonna have to come on and explain probably explain like most of this stuff that we talked about because it's going to be like wait what was that <laughs> yeah, we'll taste into something we'll get some food well you prepare you prepare tell me what you're going to have and then we'll get the wine with it we get the, the copycat yeah i just tried this cheese it's a it's a goat cheese but it's i guess it's fermented like a brie mm. and uh it's good but i also feel like when you eat like unless I feel like if we do a thing, like it'll be all right. But when you eat, like and people can hear you crunching, and then like the mic picks that up instead of yeah, like what you're saying. Okay. But it's pretty cool looking. It's definitely a stinky cheese. Oh yeah, that's nice. Yeah. So it's tangy, so it pairs well with the the sweet fruity, you know. Contrast. And I have this other one that I didn't try. It's a, uh, uh, it's like a cheddar with mustard seeds in it. Oh, okay. So I think that's gonna be cool. I was talking to the guy at the counter. I was like, 
doing this podcast. I want something cool for my wife. And uh, he was actually cool. The, other, the one guy looked at me like, I just work here, lady. <laughs> and the other guy was like, oh, I'm going to talk about cheese. <laughs> Yeah, that's that's one of the reasons I've been able to be successful because a lot of these wine uh, wine stores, some people are just like, I just work here, uh, go get the Cabernet, it's on sale, and you know, and like you said, a lot of people they'll get that bottle that's pretty, and not knowing what they get, or they'll okay, it's ten bucks, all right, I'll get this, but you know, they can come to me and get a little bit, you know, a little insight that they may not have gotten at the store, and you know, and something customary to what they want. When um. How do you feel about those diet wines? <laughs> um, here, 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 here's here, here's what I say. Okay, um, if you want a healthier wine, I would go more of the traditional wines. I go more to the traditional routes, the smaller vineyards the family own or maybe you know if you get a chance to head out to europe wherever you're traveling the smaller um boutiques and get their wines i would go more man versus machine than i would compare to getting a lot of these um diet wines that was so, good yeah but but so here's the thing also uh my last wine show i had some organic grape wines from california and they were fantastic um so you know they're you know, like everything is trial and error. Um, I think uh, with a few of the wines, they 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 didn't do justice taking the yeast out of them or taking the sugar out. I think they didn't do justice. But I think again, hey, hold uh, on. what do you mean? Elaborate. <laughs> they were just shitty wine. <laughs> no, I, I, I want to say a, a lot of customers. What, what, you know, I actually um, tasted those out to people before, and a lot of customers were saying it's missing the yeast, it's missing this, it's missing that, and so um, I tried it, and I think um, you know, it wasn't nothing I I would drink on a normal occasion, but you know, again, I, but um, two weeks ago when I when I showed the um, the organic wines, they were fantastic. They were made for the organic or the organic grapes. They were fantastic. So, for people listening, um, if you if you you know if you watch if you listen to the podcast or whatever, uh, I have been touching a lot on sustainability and organic versus conventional. So this is where this you know an organic grapevine hasn't been sprayed with any glyphosates or. Um, you know, pesticides like that. So it's the same thing, you know, same thing as buying the organic produce, it's better for you. And um, it tastes, tastes better too. Yeah, those, they were great. And also again, traditional grapes, if you can, you know, again, you know, you guys have a trip out of Italy over the summer and there's a small little village, you get them from there. Um, and a lot of the old, like if you go to Europe, a lot of that stuff is organic just because they're they're not allowed to use those exactly. pesticides. All traditional method. You know? So like in America, we have to say, oh, it's organic. But uh, you know, in Europe, they're just kind of like, no, it's just normal wine because <laughs> yeah. we're kind of dumb and put a bunch of cancer causing <laughs> stuff on our food. <laughs> yeah, because it's tight, it's tightly regulated. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's regulated here, but it's regulated for the bottom line. It's not really regulated for the health of the people. That's the problem. You know, it's get a little political right there. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so. So, yeah, that could be a, we're going to go on for another hour. <laughs> we didn't even, we didn't even touch about uh we didn't even touch about like the sparkling wines and the second fermentation and all that other stuff, but yeah, there there are a few different um, methods. Some people, the cheapest form is injecting. Is what? Um, it's it's called an injection method. Yes. There, yeah, they're very different. There are different methods to that. If you get a um, sparkling wine and it says traditional method, 
Um, it's going to be, you know, the most expensive sparkling wine that takes the longest amount of time. It's not always mo the most expensive, but it does. The traditional method would be, um, you know, you're going to have the second fermentation, which causes yep. the carbonation inside the bottles from the yeast. But the injection method is basically you're using a soda stream to create uh, <laughs> to create bubbles. So you're just carbonating it. There you go. And then there's... Also, people who spend time turning a bottle, turning a bottle, weeks and weeks turning a bottle so it's completely upside down. So. Yeah. Sparkling wine's a great bit. And and again, a, a lot of people, like you said, um, you can't call something champagne if it's not made in that region, northern um, France, champagne. Anything outside of that is sparkling. And champagne only contains three grapes. So Pinot Noir, Meunier, and Chardonnay, the only three grapes allowed in Champagne. And, um, you know, every, not every region, but a lot of the European regions, they have their own answer to Champagne. Um, Italy has Prosecco. And again, one of my favorites is Prosecco Superiore. Um, Spain has Cava. I like Cava. Then for some reason, Scandinavians love the Cava. I don't know why. I think because they go on vacation to Spain all the time. That's probably why. <laughs> but uh, yeah, they do. And the, um, you know, those, you know, champagne is usually the most expensive, right? Yeah. Um, but it's so much cheaper if you're in Europe. I gotta say that. <laughs> oh my God. One of the things that, like, was so crazy, like, you can find a great bottle of wine in like if you're actually in France or one of those places for like three dollars you come here like you really do got to spend like the 8.99 is probably the lowest I would go but uh there actually have been I had a Tempranillo for 2.99 I got it at, shout out to Presidente Supermarket <laughs> And, you know, um, it's for $2.99, like it was just as good as a, you know, any like $10, $10 bottle of wine that I've got. I was like, damn, I made, and then I bought like a bunch of them made sangria. I guess you do have the two buck chuck too, but that's $3 now. So. Yeah. I mean, well, the good thing about Spanish wines, again, they, they have a, they have their tight regulations on table wines and well, not tight regulations, but you know, a certain quality has to be there for that. Um, so you really, in my opinion, in my humble opinion, you don't find too much of a bad Spanish wine. And if you do, like you just said, you make a sangria out of it. Yeah, I love sangria. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I feel like uh, we're going to keep talking about wine, so I'm going to go. <laughs> <laughs> no, this is a great interview. And like I said, hopefully we can, um, you know, reconvene for part two. Yeah, we should tell more stories in the next one, because I feel like we were nerding out with fun facts <laughs> for like three hours. About the whole Rico's wine adventure. Yeah, I oh want to hear more adventure <laughs> stories. So maybe we'll have to plan it for right after you come back from California. Yeah, we could do that. We could talk about the stories. I have, I have some good ones, I think. All right, cool. I have some good ones. Yes, ma'am. All right, so thanks for watching, guys. Um, obviously, Rico is very knowledgeable in all things wine. So go into the description and click on the links and get in contact about him for all your wine questions. And I'll see you next time at Chef Grace's place. Thank you, Chef. Be safe.